Hi, everybody. I'm Suzanne Martin. And I'm Lindsay Knuckles. And welcome to the Find and Follow podcast. Our goal is to help you engage your faith outside of Sundays. We are currently in a series that is called This Passage Changed My Life, where our teaching pastors are diving into the passages that have changed their lives. We're talking today with Travis Janusik, who is one of our teaching pastors, and he's going to unpack the passage that he's sharing. Travis, what is the passage that has changed your life? Yeah, so wait, the passage today... Wait, tell us about yourself. Who are you? Oh, yeah, Introduce yeah. yourself. Yeah, you Who's right. Travis? Who yeah. is Travis? So the best way I can describe my job is so much of what we do here at New City takes place within our walls, which is mm. extremely vital and important and an absolute must. Uh, my job takes place outside the walls. So I try to get all of the people at New City engaged in serving and being exposed to our, our community here in Charlotte and then particularly around the world. So we do... we I partner... With we partner as a church with many global and local organizations to help people see what others are doing in this world. And really, my job as a pastor is help disciple and equip people to serve in those capacities outside these walls of our church. That's great. We do a great job of that. Thank mm-hmm. you. So what is your passage that yep. you would like to share with us today? Yeah, this is um, not only is it a passage that changed my life. This is absolutely. This is actually my favorite story in the New Testament. Okay, oh, this cool. is um, a story out of John chapter twenty-one. Uh, I stumbled upon this. Of course, I've read it many, many times in the past, but I, I stumbled upon this about seven, eight years ago, and read it in a different way. Mm-hmm. And I and it still has become my favorite story. It's one I try to read often, and and I love to talk about. But it's it's at the end of John chapter chapter twenty-one. Uh, it's 14 verses, but it, but it's an incredible story. Um, beginning, it says later, uh, this was right after the resurrection um, of Jesus. But it says later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there: Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel uh, from Cana, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John. And verse three says, Simon Peter said, "I'm going fishing." We'll come too, they all said. So they all went out into the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. So Jesus called out, fellows, friends, have you caught any fish? No, they replied in verse 6. Then he said, well, throw your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you will get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in the net. At that moment, the disciple Jesus loved, who was John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. When he heard that it was the Lord, when he heard it was Jesus, he put on his tunic, his clothes, for he had stripped for work. He jumped into the water and he headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore, for they were only about 100 yards away. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Peter went aboard, dragged the net to shore, and they had about 153 large fish, and and yet the net had not torn. Jesus said, now come and let's have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They, They knew it was Jesus. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish, and this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus sat down and spoke with Simon Peter. So great. Mm. Thanks for reading that. Yeah. All right. What is it about this passage that grabbed you the first time you read it? The more I think about it and the more I've, I've processed this story in my mind, I, I'm amazed at what Peter does. Because mm-hmm. when you read it, it's, it's so easy to read scripture and just go over details that we don't think are very important. We just don't take enough time to really invest in that. But I, I just, it's one of the funniest and best moments in the entire Bible that this grown man who, you know, history teaches us that that Peter was kind of the de facto leader of the disciples. He was largely because of his personality, but also because of his age. Uh, So you see this grown man who, when he learns his his friend, Jesus is on the shore 100 yards away. The Bible says that he throws himself into the water. Literally, the the wording there is that he he just recklessly jumps off the boat. And and even more interesting is, and I don't, I guess I'll have to ask him this when I get to heaven one day is, Peter, I don't understand why you put your clothes on <laughs> to that, swim. To swim. I mean, it's it's like if you've ever swam with clothes on, it's I mean, it's like swimming with a blanket around you. It's I mean, these guys they, they wore robes and stuff like that. So I, I never understood. 
mm, not this time of year it wouldn't say, have been but yeah. it, they they would have taken off some clothes because it's hard work fishing and so what I don't get is, is he, he sees Jesus, he comes excited, and then he throws his clothes back on when it would have made sense to probably just stay in and just lose her clothing and then swim. But what amazed me about this is what, what would cause Peter to do this? Because when you think about prominent historical figures, whether they're religious or government officials or even celebrities, things like that, this is not how people react when they see that, right? So if, if I saw a celebrity, if I saw a famous politician or something, I think the tendency for a lot of us is, is we become reserved, right? This is not how you would expect someone to act to the creator of the universe, the king of the Jews, the king of kings, all this. And yet here this guy Peter is, he recklessly, uh, full of nothing but emotion. There's nothing logical about what he does here, by the way. He, he throws himself in there. He could have easily just stayed in this boat like all the others did and just rowed back, brought the fish with him. That's the logical thing to do here. And yet he puts on his robe. He swims as hard as he can back to shore and I had to ask myself this question, why? Why is it that he does that? And the answer, I think, is it's all in how he perceives Jesus to be. And he sees Jesus at this moment as his friend. He sees Jesus as a person. He sees Jesus as this relatable and approachable king. And it's interesting because when you read the Gospels, you, you see all of the reverence and respect that, that Peter and the others have towards Jesus. They recognize him as the Messiah. They recognize him as God. They don't diminish their, their praise and, and admiration for him. And yet, they don't take away his humanity, which Jesus chose, by the way. He, mm -hmm. he purposely chose to be that, to take on flesh. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that Peter, that's how he related to Jesus. Mm -hmm. He didn't relate to Jesus from a distance. He didn't relate to Jesus in the sense that, you know, I can't approach him. I can't be around him. No, he, he's so, he, he loves Jesus so much. And he knows how much Jesus loves him. And he knows mm -hmm. the personality. And this, we don't talk about that, that word with Jesus a lot. But Jesus has a personality. Right. One of which is he, he's so inviting and accepting that the only reason I think a man like Peter would do something so silly, so <laughs> foolish, is because of how much he loves Jesus, mm -hmm. how much Jesus loves him, and, and how approachable and relatable that Jesus is in this yeah. moment. How excited he was to see him in that moment that it didn't matter. He was going to get to him fat first. Nothing else mattered. Right. Well, and what makes that even more astounding is the context right before this, right? Peter denies Jesus right. three exactly. times, mm -hmm. you know, and he is filled with great shame and he, yes. he wept at that. And so the fact that he would feel shame at having betrayed his friend yeah. and then he would see him and come running, that gives me chills, you know, and that's the it kind is. of God... That well, he and, is. And then in the passage, right, they, they had already seen Jesus after the resurrection. This mm -hmm. wasn't the first encounter, right? right? You, you can read the resurrection story, but there's something special about this moment yeah. that, as to your point, right, even seeing Jesus resurrected, he's still dealing with that shame. Peter's still wrestling with all this. And it makes you wonder, is that part of the motivation that he says, this is my moment to get to Jesus Mm. by myself. I, I want to mm. get there before all the other guys in the boat get there. Mm -hmm. But he, but he knows this about Jesus. He, he knows that Jesus chose to be there that morning. Jesus knew there, where they were. This is five 30 in the morning, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. This is very early. And so Peter understands that moment that Jesus came there for them. Mm -hmm. And, and in doing so, that's where you see this recklessness of Peter. And he's like, mm -hmm. I don't care about the fish. I don't even care about the guys in the boat right now. Mm -hmm. What I care about is getting over there to see my friend, Jesus. Good. Yeah, yeah. so good. Yeah. This is maybe random, but you mentioned reading this like seven or eight mm -hmm. years ago. Was there anything significant about that time of your life that you read the scripture or? I, I don't know that there's anything significant. Okay. I think it was just God just brought it to me right, right when he needed to, really cool. right? Yep. Is to say, I, I knew Jesus was always uh, rela relational. I understood that part, but I didn't understand the depths of that. I didn't understand how approachable he was. And I didn't understand that you can actually be this way with Jesus today, mm -hmm. right? That, that Jesus is no different today than he was 2000 years ago when this story took place. When I read this and I was walking through it the first time as a pastor, I said, that's how I want 
to be with people. I, I want to be like Jesus in that way that, that people could come to me as a person, um, that my title as a pastor would not matter um, because to most people, I'm not a pastor. To most people in this world, I'm just Travis, and that's great. Um, but regardless of my relationship with everybody, whatever people that I'm interacting with, I want that, that relatability, that approachability, but it, it really also has helped me like, you know, as I talk about prayer, right. Mm -hmm. That I, I often wonder how many times do I pray, um, with reverence, but in my reverence, I forget the relational connection mm -hmm. time with Jesus that it, sometimes he just wants me to talk, right. Mm -hmm. He just wants me to talk to him like the disciples would. He just wants me to talk to him like friend. He calls us his friend. And, and so we can't miss those things. We, we have to remember that like he chose to do this. He, he creates a personality for himself that longs for us. He, he wants us to approach him in such a way. And so it helps me pray. It helps me even worship better. It helps me interact with people better to know if I am to imitate Christ, mm -hmm. I need to imitate him in that way and that relatability. I, I was, when I was in seminary, I had a friend that I was studying with and she did that for me. She was the person that helped me see the, the, the detail that Christ wanted in my, like when I'm talking to him and like, mm -hmm. and then I look at this passage and that's mm -hmm. what I see. I mean, the detail of, he did put his clothes back on. He did, mm -hmm. there were 153 fish, like mm -hmm. the detail at which the conversation is that Jesus is approachable and we yeah. approach him with the detail. That's right. Well, and it's, it's really interesting by the way, um, this story is almost a mirror example of the first time Peter meets Jesus, by the way. When, when you go back into the synoptics gospels, you go to Luke's account, right? Same thing happens. Peter and John are on the boat. They don't catch anything. Jesus says, you catch anything? No, we didn't catch anything. Well, go out a little further and you'll catch some more. The same thing happens, right? It's the end of the stories that are different. Because in the first account, when, when the Peter and John catch all the fish. They come back to shore. And what you see, Peter's first reaction to meeting Jesus is that he falls down on his knees mm -hmm. and he begins crying and he says, depart from me, God, because I am a sinner, right? That's his first reaction. And yet here you are now three years later, mm -hmm. the exact same story, but this time... He's not falling on his knees. He's not begging Jesus to get out of his way. He's not mm -hmm. saying, oh, I'm a terrible sinner, even though he's wrestling with mm -hmm. that whole guilt yeah. of, I mm -hmm. just betrayed this guy. Mm -hmm. Even in that context, he still comes to Jesus and he says, that's, that's my Lord. And he goes up mm -hmm. to it. And, and there's, I like how one author put it. He said, you know, think of it uh, this way that, you know, when, when Peter gets up to the shore, right, you almost have this this idea that as soon as he gets up there and he's worn out, he, he just all soaking wet, you know, he goes up there and he hugs Jesus. Yeah. And if he doesn't, then Jesus does it mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Such two almost exact same stories, cool. but the outcome is vastly different. It's really cool. Yeah. I also love that Jesus made breakfast for his friends. Mm -hmm. It's like the power of breakfast, yes. right? It's like, and the power of like a shared meal together. I think that's yeah. really significant. Yeah. It, this is the creator of the universe. Yes. This mm -hmm. is the king of the universe who mm -hmm. is sitting on the dusty shores of the Sea of Galilee and he's built a tiny campfire, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, it's what a meaningful thing to yeah. do for people is to say, I made you breakfast, right? I mean, that how much more approachable can you get than, than someone to say, Hey, I want, I I'm here. I've made mm. you breakfast. Right. It's good. No, no, nobody does yeah. that. Well, Travis, is there something from this passage that maybe you didn't notice the first time, but then the second, the fifth, the hundredth time you were like, Oh, that's really yeah. cool. The contrast between the two stories are, are huge, but there's another phrase that I, that I like in, in this story um, once again, it's a phrase that you would probably just read over and not think much of, but it says um, the disciples dare not ask who he was. They knew who he was. Mm -hmm. And and that's also contrasting to the original story because when he when he comes out and he and he meets Peter and Andrew and he meets James and John, they're they think they know who he is. They've got an idea. James and John have been um, kind of discipled a little bit by John the Baptist. Peter and Andrew have no idea who this guy is. And and so there's an initial recognition though, even when Peter falls down, he's like, Okay, this this is a man of God. This guy is from heaven. He's gotta be from God to do what he just did. But it's interesting that three years later that John specifically writes down we didn't ask this time. Mm -hmm. we, we knew exactly who this guy was. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's 
it's so cool as you think about your spiritual life is when you when you become a Christian, you're engaging in those initial questions like, who is God? What is he all about? What what all encapsulates him? And yet as we grow in our faith, we're able to say, no, we know who it is. Mm-hmm. And, and we know those moments that only God could do, right? Yeah. That's I think that's one of the joys as we grow in our faith is we say moments happen in our life where like, that was God. Mm-hmm. That, that was not coincidence. Mm-hmm. That was not something that, no, that's something that God himself intervened on. So I'd love that John adds just that quick little sentence there that says they dared not mm-hmm. ask because they knew. I love that. That is beautiful. Mm-hmm. So how is your life different as a result of this scripture? A big one is I think of like the people I come in connection with. I think of my family and I think of people in our church and in our world, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I alluded to this a little earlier. It's yeah. like I want to be that approachable person. I want to be that relatable person. But I think especially is it, it makes me all the more have the desire for people to see him in the same way. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, I think we all, each of us come from different backgrounds, especially if you come from different religious backgrounds. Mm-hmm. I think if we're honest, we've done probably more disservice to talking about the mm-hmm. humanity of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're fear that by doing that, we take away reverence from God. I actually believe that the better you see the humanity of Jesus, the more more likely you are to appreciate his divinity. And, and those two things have to be put together. I think this is funny. When you look at um, a lot of Christian movies, watch how they depict Jesus. He's this kind of stoic character mm-hmm. who you know, just kind of walks around with his shoulders up high and everybody's mm-hmm. kind of fearful of him and all that. And I don't think that's how he is. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's how he chose to relate to people. He's funny. He's witty. Mm-hmm. He's smart. He's all these things. And and I want people to see that side of him, right? Mm-hmm. And and understand that you you can say that Jesus is funny. You can mm-hmm. say that he's witty, all these things. And he's, he's playful. He, he does things that are just kind of funny at times. And that doesn't take away from his... Um, complete, you know, deservedness mm-hmm. of, of praise and admiration, admiration, mm-hmm. all that. In fact, if you can see him more as the person, you'll appreciate more of the yeah. divinity side of it. Yeah. And you talked about that earlier when you talked about your prayer life and yeah. how that really changed your prayer life. And yeah. I would love to hear if you don't mind sharing, just like, what does yeah. prayer look like for you on a practical level, just with that view of Christ? Think about when, when Peter comes up to the water or when mm-hmm. he comes out of the water, and there's nothing to suggest that he's like, okay, now I got to put mm. myself together, yeah, right? Like good. here's a guy who's, he's got all this stuff hanging off of him. He's soaking wet. I mean, who, who knows? He's dirty, all this stuff. And that he doesn't care, right? That's not, he because he knows Jesus doesn't care about mm. that as well, right? And so I think even in prayer, right, we, we make this mistake of, okay, I've got to come to Jesus um, mm-hmm. with it all together. I've got to, I want to make sure my language is holy and good. Uh, this is why, by the way, I love to hear the two best people who pray in the world are children and new believers mm-hmm. because they haven't clouded their language yet with Christianese and, and trying to make it too formal and proper. They just start talking. And that's exactly how I, th- you know, this passage helps me in my prayer life is just to just to talk with Christ and and to even say things like Jesus, I love you, I love you for everything that you've done. I, I want to thank you for these things today, and and once again, it doesn't diminish my my view of His awesomeness and His divineness, but it, it just shows to me that even in His divine. He says, I want you to approach me. I want you to see me the way my disciples saw me because that's who I still am today. To be in relationship, you don't, to, for us to sit here and have a conversation, we don't make our language, we don't take words. We mm-hmm. were just each other. We were laughing before we started. Yeah. Like, yeah. like that's part of our relationship with Christ. And I love that picture right. of how we come to him when we pray. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just that yeah, conversation. It, we we would be acquaintances if, if our language mm-hmm. was just purely formal. Right. right? But... Um, it's that informal talk, mm-hmm. right? That just, just tell me what you're thinking, what you're processing. Don't worry about how it all sounds. And I, and I just love that picture that it's that's good. exactly how Peter's on. Yeah, that's really so. good. So before we wrap up, yep. um, and maybe you've shared this already, but is there a main idea that you think God wants us to take away from this passage? From this, I think Jesus wants us to see him as approachable. That's good. I, that's really I think good. Jesus wants us to see him as relatable but I think in that he, he wants us to come to him joyfully like Peter mm. does, right? That mm-hmm. even when you're scared or sad or frustrated, it doesn't matter what emotion you face yourself in. And for Peter, he was probably a lot of emotions at that point. 
but regardless, he knew he could come to him. And I think that's exactly the picture is that this story teaches and that I want to encourage people with is that's how we need to act towards Jesus. I, I want us to run joyfully to him, knowing he's right there waiting for us, no matter what baggage we brought there with us. Amen. So. I love that. I love that. So thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you for this conversation. And to close us, yes. will you pray? It would be my joy. Thanks. Yeah, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that, as always, as the leader, you, mm. you led by example, and you you chose to come down in human form. There was a lot of ways that you could have addressed the issues of this world, but you chose the hardest path. You chose stepping down from heaven and coming down in human form and living life with people. And I'm so thankful for this story that we see uh, the great example of, of how relatable and personal you are. That a grown man um, was so loved you so much and knew how much you loved him that he abandoned ship and he swam as fast as he could to you. And we knew you welcomed him with open arms. And I thank you for that. I think that, that you are that God. You are the God that on one hand, are the creator, the ruler of the universe. You are worthy of praise, and yet you are also the God who will sit down around a campfire with us and cook us breakfast. And that, that just amazes me. And so just want to tell you, Jesus, that love you, and thank you for first loving me and for loving everybody else. And I just pray that each of us could have that mindset of Peter, um, that we... we would be aware of those encounters when you intervene in our lives we would rejoice and that no matter what we're feeling we could come to you uh, joyfully thanks for making it all possible through the cross amen amen thank you, thank you. and thanks for joining us today you can find us anywhere you listen to podcast we'll see you next time <laughs>